You're listening to a TVO podcast. The following podcast contains coarse language, descriptions of violence, and sensitive themes which may not be suitable for younger audiences. Listener discretion is advised. Previously on Unascertained. Ambulance, what is your emergency? We have an inmate with vital signs absent. Ontario guards killed my brother in a violent beating. I see a bigger guard who kind of whispers in Solomon's ear. Whatever it was, it scared the shit out of Solomon because all I seen him was he started pushing back like he didn't want to go in the cell. And the real question is, were they doing what they were trained to do and following the training correctly? I am just thrown off by the um, leaving somebody face down and handcuffed to the rear. You cannot leave somebody like that. That part shocks me. You do not ever put a spit hood on someone who's been sprayed. You had so many untrained staff and a simple permission to initiate ISA would have quashed the entire thing. Some of these facts that have come forward about the Suleiman Fakiri case haven't seemed to be taken into account in the post-mortem report. Those are exactly the questions that need to be canvassed. Earlier this year, we learned about the tragic death of a young man named Suleiman Fakiri from the TVO podcast, Unascertained. And now, thanks in part to that podcast, we have an update to the story. In 500 meters, your destination will be on the left. Completely surrounded by like either like cornfields or forests. Back when I started this podcast, I reached out to many people involved in the Fakiri case to try and speak with them. Guards from the Lindsay Jail, Kortha Lakes police officers, and government officials from the Ministry of the Solicitor General. Many turned me down, and some I never heard back from. When the podcast was released, very quickly, listeners reached out, especially after our last episode with former correctional officer Stephen Benko. Former and current jail staff suddenly wanted to speak while they weren't involved in Suleiman's death, they felt like there was more to the story that we needed to know. But there was one person who really surprised me. Five days after our last episode aired, I received this message on Facebook. Good day, sir. My name is Jeff Burke. I was the Kortha Lakes Police Service detective who was in charge of the Fakiri investigation. I think maybe we should talk. Okay. Good drive up. Yeah. Yeah, it was nice actually. Yeah. It was a good time, I guess. Yeah. Been yeah. Too long. Yes. Yeah. If you had been any later on a Friday. Burke is no longer a police officer for the Kortha Lakes Police Service. We meet him at his countryside home in rural Lindsay, Ontario. It's a humid summer afternoon, and the air is thick. Burke greets us in the driveway as he tosses his cigarette. His small yet energetic dog is eager to greet us next as we approach the backyard. Oh, good girl. Yeah, grab a seat anywhere. Hello, cool. down, down. Good girl. Do you want to be, do you care where you are? Uh, well, where are you? Well, we actually chat. Probably we'll do oh, okay, yeah, cool. For the first time, I was about to sit down with the first police officer who investigated Suleiman Fakiri's death almost five years ago, and concluded no charges should be laid. And I was gonna find out why. I'm Yusuf Zine, and this is Unascertained. Good? Okay. So why don't we just start with like introducing yourself. You yep. Just tell us your name and a little bit about yourself. Yeah, my name's Jeff Burke. I uh, spent, um, the better part of 13 or 14 years with the Kortha Lakes Police. I, uh, de- over the years I developed um, PTSD and uh, so I've been off work for three years now and uh, resigned from the police service there about a year ago, which gives me the opportunity to speak about this because if I uh, hadn't resigned and still was a cop, I wouldn't be able to anyways under the Police Service Act, I couldn't talk about it. During his time as a detective, Burke's primary focus were cases of offenses against children 12 and under, which he says contributed to his PTSD. Investigating offenses against these these little kids, right? It just breaks your heart. When you're interviewing a three-year-old over a sex assault and they've been through so many horrific things, 
and then there's you know the kitty porn and stuff like that which you have to deal with and so yeah my mental health was already damaged in 2011 i was doing a search warrant and uh, i took a machete to the head and i was involved in a search warrant where a active shooter came at the entry team and he had to be killed so certainly uh having to deal with that sort of incident, especially with the young kids of my own, it uh, sent me back down that PTSD black hole. And then uh, in December of 2016, um, I was assigned uh, this case uh, regarding Mr. Fakiri being one of the- Burke says he was already struggling when tasked with investigating Sully's death. Yeah, they, they, they worked me pretty hard to this case was finished. And in fact, it was the day I finally handed in my uh, conclusion and, and finished the file when my gun was taken and I was told- uh, So this was literally your last case? This was my last case, yeah. I said the day I finished this case is the day I, I left work for, for good. But there's more to the story when it comes to Burke's departure from KLPS. After he had finished the Fakiri case, Burke was caught stealing drugs from the police station's evidence locker. He was then suspended and faced charges of theft, possession of stolen property, and breach of trust. In May of 2019, he pleaded guilty to one count of breach of trust. And a year later, he resigned from the police force. According to Burke, all of this was attributed to his ongoing battle with PTSD. You know, we, uh, we've been wanting to speak with you for a while, and, and I think a lot of people are wondering, why have you decided to want to speak out publicly? Uh, that's a good question. Um, first of all, for the family's sake, I only met them once, so I talked with them on the phone a few times. And, uh, you know, they seem like fantastic people, and they deserve to know what happened. And uh, second of all, you know, this incident happens and some odd 10, 12, whatever it was, jail guards involved who went hands-on with uh, Mr. Fakiri. You know, they're the ones that ate this in the media. They were crucified. They were thrown under the bus. And uh, in my opinion, the people who um, made the biggest mistakes and who are responsible for what happened are administration at the jail and the Ministry of uh, Correctional Services. Like Stephen Benko and so many others in corrections have expressed to us over the past few months, Burke also believed that the administration was responsible for Sully's death because of one crucial error, refusing a request to get help from ICIT. The Institutional Crisis Intervention Team, or ICIT, is specifically trained in moving violent and non-compliant inmates. Initially, a call was made by the correctional officers to request the assistance of ICIT in moving Suleiman from the showers to his cell. But that request was denied and the officers were advised to handle the situation themselves. Not only did they deny ICIT, but the team was working that day. Like the ICIT team was at the correctional center doing training, but it's, it's so frustrating because watching the video, once the fight starts, they call out a cold blue, which means that the jail guards need assistance with a violent prisoner. And the ICIT team was literally 30 seconds away. So on the video, as the- That video Brooks referring to is the CCTV surveillance tape from the hallway. It captured the struggle between Suleiman and the six guards, but that tape hasn't been released to the public. And Burke remembers seeing the ICIT team on the tape, right in the hallway. But uh, you can see on video, somebody shooing them away. Um, I don't know who that person was. So the fact that they'd never called an ICIT, I, in my belief, is a pretty major issue as to why Mr. Fakiri's death ended up happening. For Burke, the decision to not deploy the ICIT team was enough to explore the possibility of criminally charging the jail's administration and the ministry. So in the criminal code, there's a section that allows you to charge an organization for uh, criminal negligence causing death or crim neg causing bodily harm. And tossing this idea around with a couple other officers, and uh, I came to the belief that we should be investigating the ministry for uh, that charge. Um, so I brought that to the attention of uh, the major case manager, and as you can imagine, that didn't go anywhere. I guess the thought of going into the jail and putting handcuffs on somebody in management was uh, not the best idea. Before our interview, Burke asked if I could bring a copy of his police notes from the investigation, the ones we received in the Freedom of Information files, since he didn't have them anymore. 
He said he remembered writing some of this down in his notebook, which was only used for the Fakiri case. But a lot of what was released publicly was redacted by Korthalik's police. There's no mention of his suggestion of possible charges against the management or ministry. There were even whole pages missing. What was the reason they gave you um, for not uh, pursuing that? I, I don't think there's even a reason. Um, I think it was more like I was just laughed out of the office, um, as if I was just uh, joking around about it or something. But you were serious. Yeah, oh, I was dead serious. And, and I'm not saying I was going to go march into the jail and arrest somebody, or, but uh, I thought it was an avenue that needed to be investigated anyways. And the fact that after speaking to the supervisors, that it was obvious that that wasn't going to be an avenue of investigation, that I uh, moved on anyhow. During his investigation, Yusuf Fakiri and his family were publicly calling for Kowarthalik's police to lay criminal charges against the guards. Yeah, the further we went along, the more and more obvious it was that it was becoming political. And, you know, and we expected that. First of all, it's jail guards, government employees killing a... Uh, and again, I, when I'm not laying blame when I say kill, but, you know, their actions being involved in the death of somebody. So that's political in and of itself. Um, Mr. Fakiri obviously had mental health issues, um, which, again, makes it political. Um, you know, he's Muslim, and uh, I knew that would make it political. So it was kind of a, the trifecta of, of hot-button issues at the time. And then in 2017, the coroner's report was released, and the cause of death came out as unascertained. This is what Burke and other officers had been waiting on before they could conclude their investigation. What was your reaction to that report? And what was the general uh, reaction of other officers working on the case to this? Oh, that's kind of a loaded question. Um, being a police officer, we, we've learned about, I think it's called positional asphyxiation. Um, it's something that, you know, I went to police college in 2003 and even back then we were taught not to leave somebody especially somebody in a state of distress not to leave them handcuffed to the back and laying on their stomach just because it can cause uh, positional asphyxiation um, yeah so I was a bit surprised when the report came back inconclusive in fact uh, myself and another officer when we read the report kind of looked at each other and raised an eyebrow very early on in the investigation Burke had already put the pieces together of how he believed Suleiman could have died. You know, the spit hood was put on, he was pepper sprayed, there were knee strikes, they did put knees on their back, his back, he was handcuffed to the, the rear and laid face down within his cell. And yeah, we believe that that would be the cause of his death, the positional asphyxiation. Um, I don't know if that was even brought up in the original report, um, I'm not it sure. It wasn't, eh? Yeah. Anyways, uh, yeah, so we raised an eyebrow about that, but again, we're not doctors, you know, we're just dumb cops. Those actions, the combination of the spit hood, pepper spray, and prone position restraint, went against ministry policies. And like Burke already figured out, they can lead to positional asphyxiation. So why didn't he lay charges? So walk me through like the, the justification for somebody who makes a decision that is contrary to policy that leads to death, why it wouldn't lead to criminal charges. First of all, they, they're given some leeway because they're in this dynamic fluid situation. Uh, sometimes stuff happens, which is might be a bit outside of uh, the policies and procedures. As far as physical abuse to the body, we had some concerns about him being pepper sprayed and then them putting a spit hood on. There's some evidence that they might have put pressure on the back of Mr. Fakiri in locations that they shouldn't. But again, it's a dynamic situation. They have somebody who's fighting them, spinning on them, trying to bite them. You do what you can to uh, essentially win the fight. And winning the fight's not causing undue violence to the individual. Winning the fight's just controlling the individual so you can disengage and that protects the victim slash uh, assaulter. And then that protects the jail guards. And then as far as, you know, the fight within the cell proper, you know, he was laid on his belly handcuffed, which you say was against their policy. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's a, that's a policy failure, that's a training failure, but it's not criminal. Burke's framing of this situation as a fight, rather than a struggle or beating, is important here. Law enforcement are authorized to use force one level above an assailant trying to fight them. For example, if an inmate takes a swing at a guard, that guard is allowed to use a baton or pepper spray. If someone runs at a cop with a knife, that cop is authorized to use a gun. 
But eyewitness John Tebow's testimony describes a very different scenario, one of a beating rather than a fight. They got him to the ground twice when they were beating him. And as soon as he hit the ground, stomp in his head. Every time he hit the ground, wham, punched him, anything they could get in. He had his knee on his neck every time they got on the ground, but the third time he couldn't get back up. That's why he's trying to get away from the cell. That's why he was running into the walls. That's how on them they were. Like they were, it was, and it was aggression, it was anger. Burke says the guards were trying to get away from Suleiman. Thibault says that Suleiman was trying to get away from the guards. But Burke wouldn't know what Thibault saw because neither Burke nor anyone else involved in the investigation obtained an interview with Thibault. And it turns out, Burke and Thibault actually go back a bit. Burke knew him because he had arrested him a number of times. But that being said, uh, it was a bit of a shock because, you know, the Central East houses inmates from up well, Central East Ontario. So the chances that somebody who I was so familiar with was, was right there was a uh, coincidence anyways. So why not interview him for his investigation? I believe some of our investigators from our police service talked to him the day of or shortly thereafter, but he wouldn't provide a statement or he might have said he didn't see anything, I don't remember. Thibault did dodge police officers in the beginning, as he said he was afraid for his safety to speak out against guards. But eventually he came out and said he did witness something and agreed to speak to Burke, but only when he was released from jail. But the investigation closed two days before Thibault was released. At one point, I actually stood in the cell that he was lodged in. It, it's my recollection that there was no clear view from the cell Mr. Tebow was in into Fakiri's cell, but I can't say that for certain. Like I said, everybody remembers things different. I certainly am not going to accuse him of lying. Um, he remembers things the way he remembers them, and he, he quite possibly could be correct, and I'm mistaken here, but I, I, I truly don't know. Burke told us that he never collected Thibault's statement because he wasn't convinced he really saw anything and thought the investigation would already be over by the time Thibault was released from jail. But Thibault was later interviewed by the OPP and told them his entire testimony. They deemed him a credible witness. Um, again, besides what I mentioned before, that in a dynamic situation, shit happens. I believe that I could not form the grounds that the offense of uh, homicide or, or manslaughter had occurred, and that being the case, I didn't have grounds to charge them. And then add to the fact, the coroner's report that I looked at anyways, that we went off of, there was no obvious cause of death. According to the Criminal Code of Canada, everyone who is authorized by law to use force is criminally responsible for any excess. In other words, if you go above the level of acceptable use of force, that's a criminal offense whether it was a beating or not is, you know, physical strikes. So it's contrary to policy, but is it not illegal to use excessive use of force? Uh, in that situation, I guess the conclusion we came to is that it wasn't excessive um, because he was being assaultive. Do you think it was um, a reasonable amount of uh, use of force, given that he was subdued and the actions that you know were used by the guards? In, in your mind, is that reasonable? Yeah, if I had to have come to the conclusion that it wasn't reasonable, then they would have been charged, right? But no, I, I don't judge the, the guards in the heat of the moment for doing what they did, knowing his, his mental health issues. At that point, unfortunately, it's not a mental health case to the jail guards. It's a violent inmate who they need to get under control for everybody's safety. While Burke admits he can't recall all the details from almost five years ago, his position on the guards' actions was pretty clear. However, after all of this time on the story, I was a little taken aback by Burke's justification. A dynamic situation. A fight. Shit happens. Self-defense is considered reasonable, to a degree. If a law enforcement officer believes they are in danger, the criminal code lets them use force, even up to deadly force. But it also depends on various circumstances the size, age, gender, and physical capabilities of the people involved, the level of the force, and whether there were other means available to respond. So was Sully really that much of a threat next to several correctional officers? Or was he even fighting back at all? And was this the same justification used by the OPP in their investigation? 
Even with John Tebow's testimony, no charges were laid. Was it possible that investigators felt, without a cause of death, the post-mortem ruling of unascertained, it was too difficult to lay charges? Before I was able to wrap my head around all of this, I got a call. I'm Andrew Kamen. I'm a lawyer partner at the firm of Polishek, Kamen & Steel. I uh, represent uh, two managers who were involved in the conflict with the inmate. These two managers were fired after an internal ministry investigation took place in 2018. But that report, which includes the reasons why the managers were fired, has not been released to the public. One manager was part of the original escort of Sully from the showers to the cell, and the other was the manager who arrived on the scene and made the call to handcuff him to the rear. You may remember we took you through her statement in part six of the podcast. To remain anonymous, we called her Sergeant Smith, and for this interview, the lawyer requested we continue to keep their names anonymous. So can you elaborate on what were the reasons why your clients were let go or fired by the ministry? Well, my opinion is they were let go because the government did not want to take responsibility for its mistakes in this case. Uh, one of my managers was involved for approximately 10 minutes when she responded to the Code Blue. Code Blue is a call to all available officers in the facility to assist in an emergency. The Code Blue call was made while the six guards were struggling with Suleiman in the cell. She responded with about 10 to 15 other correctional officers who are required by policy to respond and felt that the matter was sufficiently handled. And so she didn't enter into the cell area until it became apparent that the situation was not settling down. When she went to the door, she saw that there were four correctional officers attempting to restrain the inmate and get out of the cell, and the inmate was not allowing that to happen. Similar to Burke, Kamen believed the actions of the guards were in self-defense. The four managers were in fear of their lives. And I know how strange that may sound to people who have never dealt with a violent, mentally ill person before, but his strength was 10 times the ability and strength of four managers. They were losing the battle. And so all that she did in that 10 minutes was to try and get them out of the cell. In order to do that, the handcuffs had to be moved behind his back. It's controversial, there's no doubt about that, but it's also permissible under their policies in an extreme situation, which is what she felt that, that it was. According to Cayman, under the crisis management policy, the order of preservation goes like this. Number one obligation of a correctional officer is to protect the public. Number two is to protect the officers. And number three, is the inmate. The other manager was a manager who had requested that ISIT, who are trained in the moving of mentally ill inmates, requested that ISIT be assigned. The ISIT team was in the institution. It was dressed and ready. The ISIT manager was right there in the corridor of that unit, but was not permitted to intervene. And do you know why they were not permitted to intervene? The direction for what was going on in this institution, we were told was coming from a regional office, off premises. Somebody who didn't understand the situation correctly, had misinterpreted the situation, ignored the request of my manager, whom they then fired and they abandoned him. I'm going to tell you, he was let go because the government doesn't want to admit that it made a mistake. It has to blame someone. It has to look like somebody is responsible, and they wanted to make him responsible. We've asked the ministry to comment on the denial of the request for ICIT several times, but have not received a response. Was the ICIT call really denied by someone who wasn't even in the building that day? Despite the denial of the ICIT call, the officers and managers took actions that ministry policies warned against. 
In a transcript publicly released in late December of 2020, Sergeant Smith said she did not know Suleiman had been pepper sprayed and was wearing a spit hood. If she did, she said she would have never cuffed his hands to the rear while in a prone position, as that is a triple threat risk of asphyxia. You have to understand that this was chaos at this point in time when she arrived on the scene and her focus actually wasn't on the inmate at that particular moment. It was on getting the four managers who were trapped in that cell and couldn't get out. And the spit hood is transparent. It's mesh. So it's understandable that she wouldn't have been able to see that. I mean, it does seem that, uh, you know, a major cause of Suleiman's death was the combination of the spit of the pepper spray and, and prone position restraint. And it seems that not just your clients, but... I don't, I don't agree with that. Oh, you don't? That, that, no, there's, there's absolutely no evidence of that. So it's certainly a theory. It's certainly possible. I and mean, I have a theory too. Uh, he was eating his own feces. He struggled with superhuman strength with many officers for 20 plus minutes. And he was exhausted at the end of that, and his heart couldn't take it. That's equally plausible. I get it that they have a policy that you can't do handcuffs and um, pepper spray. I, I get that. The pepper spray, and we should clarify that, there was no pepper spray. What do you mean by that? that specifically, there was no pepper spray. There was pepper foam. I'm not being specious here. It's, there's a big difference between pepper spray, which can be inhaled, and foam, which is, doesn't have the same volatility that pepper spray does. My client didn't know there had been foam. Foam doesn't go in the air, so you can't really smell it. She had a cold on that day, too, by the way. That may have been a contributing factor as well. And couldn't see the spit hook. According to the police report, the pepper spray was in a foam consistency. The main difference being that it produces fewer fumes and is used for smaller and confined spaces. This would explain why other officers didn't seem to be affected by it, as it's meant to only target the assailant. However, after researching various pepper spray manufacturers, including the one used by the correctional officers, I couldn't find much difference in volatility. The foam clings to the attacker, quickly turns into a liquid, and can still be ingested orally. And the more you wipe your face, the more agitated it gets. To me, the more likely cause of death was exhaustion. But would you recognize that the combination of those elements as well, the spit with pepper spray, could also be a contributing factor to his death? Yes, absolutely. I don't think you can rule those out. It's just that they become too convenient. But I was a correctional officer. I have dealt with mentally ill patients. I don't think people understand the superhuman strength that mentally ill patients have and why they become so dangerous. Hmm. I guess the question is, do you think there's any consideration for the fact that he did have a mental illness when we're talking about their use of force? Not once they're involved in it. At that point in time, you're, it's survival. There was no doubt that there was punches thrown. But you'd have to do that. Again, it's not to blame the inmate. Maybe it's what the public doesn't understand or doesn't see. But what do you do? What, what should they have done? Should they have tried to get out of that cell or not? Do you think there could have been a better way for them to have handled the situation? I can tell you that my male client was asked, what would he do differently? And his response was, if they ordered me to move him, I would get sick and go home. My female client, she wishes that before they left the cell, that they had they would have turned him on his side. That's that's what she wishes had been done. It's a very important to these people that they made a mistake, but it's not criminal. So then the question begs itself again: shouldn't someone be held responsible? My clients, both of them, and I would say every single officer who was in that cell that day feels responsible for the death of the inmate. They lament the death of the inmate. That is a failure in their minds, and they do feel guilt. They do feel that they are responsible. Now, would they agree that they violated policy? 
it is a violation of the policy to have handcuffs, bed hoods, and pepper foam all in conjunction. The issue is, was it done knowing any of those things? And, and in the, the chaos, it wasn't. I, I should also tell you, all of these people are suffering from PTSD. Every single one of them. Uh, one, a relatively new correctional officer, hasn't been back to work since. Since this incident? Yeah. This is like a wartime fatality in their minds. There's no joy in any of the correctional officers over this. I think everybody regrets this. This was actually the first time I heard about the trauma the correctional officers faced. A man died on their watch. Maybe this whole ordeal just got out of hand and became too much for officers who truly weren't trained for this. But why weren't they trained? Or were the best trained among them not called in, as Burke and Kamen suggest? The basics still hold. Policies were broken, and somebody died. But nobody really seems to be denying that. Aside from administrative reprimands, no one is accountable? Did it all go back to where we started? A death that is unascertained is just a mystery? The final thing that I was hoping would provide some clarity and answers was the updated post-mortem report. You may remember after our podcast aired, Dr. Michael Palanin announced he would be personally re-reviewing the post-mortem report to investigate the cause of death. Yusuf Fakiri said it best when he called it cautious optimism. But I was hoping this might be the last piece of the puzzle to help make sense of this case. And finally, on August 10th, 2021, Dr. Palanin finished his report. For almost five years, Suleiman's cause of death was listed as unascertained, meaning the pathologist couldn't determine exactly how or why he died. And now, here's what it says. Prone position restraint and musculocutaneous injuries sustained during the struggle Exertion and pepper spray exposure in the setting of cardiomegaly and worsening symptoms of schizophrenia. In other words, the actions the guards took to restrain Suleiman were the cause of his death. In 2016, Suleiman Fakiri died while in custody at the Central East Correctional Center in Lindsay, Ontario. For years, the cause of his death was deemed unascertained, according to two police investigations, and no criminal charges were laid. And now the province's chief forensic pathologist has conclusively determined that his death was caused by the actions of correctional officers. On Tuesday, Ontario's chief pathologist released a damning report, concluding Fakiri's death was indeed caused by multiple correctional guards beating, pepper spraying, and restraining him. It's about time. It's about time that coroner's office did the right thing, and it's about time that any government institution in Ontario did the right thing. I think it was important to finally see some meaningful analysis. Nader Hassan and Ted Morocco have been legally representing the Fakiri family almost since the beginning. And I think that the Palanin review is so important because it's that finally we see a meaningful analysis of all those facts. Because quite frankly, the first post-mortem report, it didn't have much if any analysis. And now we've seen someone turn their mind to taking those facts and actually telling us what it means. Dr. Palanin's report is only 11 pages long, but it appears to be comprehensive. He lists eight possible factors that may have contributed to Suleiman's death and gives a detailed explanation for each. A few of them include struggle and exertion, prone position restraint, his injuries, neck compression, pepper spray, and spit hood. As for the actual mechanism of death, he provides three possibilities. The first is anoxia, which is a lack of oxygen in the blood starving his brain of the oxygen it needed to function. The second is arrhythmia, which is his heart stopping beating. And the third is a combination of both of those mechanisms. Palanin refers to the event in the cell as a violent struggle and attributes the multiple injuries on his body to the strikes from correctional officers or his body hitting the ground. But none of those injuries appear to be individually fatal. 
However, he does mention that the injuries would have contributed to what's called a catecholamine response, which is a dramatic surge in adrenaline through the body. Palanin states that this was likely caused by pain. He goes on to talk about the pepper spray and spit hood, and says while on their own they don't pose a fail threat, when combined, they can. There was also a description of neck compression, which came from John Thibault seeing a knee on Sully's neck. A bruise was found on the left side of his neck. Palanin says this was likely not the sole cause of his death, but could have contributed to it. And finally, he talks about the prone position restraint and says it could have had a double effect in his death, proarrhythmic and asphyxial. In other words, Sully being restrained on his stomach may have contributed to his lack of oxygen and his heart to fail. Yeah, Palanin has confirmed the pathway. Remember, some, some thought, well, maybe he asphyxiated. Maybe there was some mortal injury that just wasn't somehow identified in the autopsy. But Palanin has stepped in and said, no, it, it, it's actually, the pathway is fairly apparent to him. He said, look, it makes sense that this is a, a, a person who could have had basically a fatal stoppage of the heart or otherwise fatal breakdown of the body for lack, lack of oxygen. That's the hypoxia theory. As a result of Dr. Palanin's new findings, the case has been returned to the Ontario Provincial Police, the OPP, for possible criminal charges against the correctional officers involved in the cell. This will be the third time that Suleiman's case has been investigated by police for potential criminal charges. When you have Ontario's pathologists saying that it's unascertained, that creates some doubt and confusion. And that confusion has, has now been resolved. The police cited that, among other reasons, all of them equally boneheaded, but they cited the unascertained finding as the reason why they couldn't lay charges. But hearing Burke's justification for not laying charges back in 2017, the dynamic situation he described, made me think, even now with a cause of death, would the OPP lay charges? Ted said that question bothers him, because it implies there's a two-tier justice system. It suggests that there actually is a different criminal justice system for regular people and for law enforcement, whether correctional officer or police officer. To me, it just suggests, frighteningly, that some police officers seem to think that there's a different criminal justice system depending on who the accused are. And there just isn't. The opportunities for governments and police agencies to sweep this case under the rug are, are running out. Now the case is referred back to provincial police for possible criminal charges. While family and friends await word, more than 40 organizations and prominent Canadians have sent out statements of support and are demanding accountability. The guards to, uh, they say, killed solely as... In late August of 2021, over 40 mental health organizations, human rights lawyers, and even politicians issued statements of support following Palanin's review all calling for accountability and transparency. Some, including Yusuf Fakiri and his group, Justice for Sully, still demanding criminal charges. Finally, finally, Yusuf, there was a, a government institution that took a sincere look as to what happened to Sully. But this report, Yusuf, leaves no question, no doubt, sir, between the actions of the guard and the death of Suleiman Fakiri. Yusuf Fakiri has been advocating for this since the moment his sister came up those stairs on a late December night and told him their brother was dead. And he has no intentions of slowing down. You know, we, 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 when we got this report, Yusuf, we said, like, did it have to take this long? Yusuf, did it have to take this much fighting? Did it have to take this much hard work? My family was not asking the government a favor or the police a favor. All we're asking is to do your job, Yusuf. And, like, to see this report, like, you know, there is a level of hope that, like, okay, look, there's no more doubt. I could leave this earth, Yusuf, knowing. And you know, when we talked in front of my brother's grave, I promised that I would not give up until I, I get my last breath. But, like, this report, like, at least I can now, this case is far from over, Yusuf, because we haven't gotten accountability, but I can at least 
make some peace with this idea you said that I no longer have to scream to the world or tell people like my brother was killed by the guards so here we are again what started out as a quest for answers in a mini series podcast turned into a case that unfolded right in front of my eyes individuals who eluded us from day one now speaking on the record a family who wanted to know what happened in that cell now has more of the truth and a death status that was once unascertained is now ascertained but there's one question that's yet to be answered who will be held responsible i've spent the past two years thinking what if what if Iset had been activated what if that psychologist who calmed Sully down just stayed a little while longer? What if that guard hadn't whispered something to Sully which agitated him? What if someone had turned Sully over on his side instead of his stomach? I could go on and on, but it won't bring him back. Clearly the ministry training failed these guards, and in turn, the guards failed Sully. But if you were to ask me who should be charged, well... And that's where it gets tricky. Does accountability look like arresting all the guards who used force on Suleiman and locking them away? Or does the absence of criminal charges for anyone signal an evasion of justice? How do we get justice for Sully? Maybe I'm not the right person to answer these questions. But I do know that our window inside Ontario prisons is getting smaller. In June of 2021, Ontario quietly disbanded all 10 community advisory boards overseeing jails. The reports these advisory boards were creating were key to learning how inmates were being treated, and were even incredibly useful to us for our research in this podcast. And from attending so many rallies and protests, it's easy to see that our system is failing so many other families. tossed him in a cell, and when they found him barely clinging to his life, they did not give Narcan. I can't bring my brother back. I thought I was helping him that day, but the jail made him feel so hopeless and he just needed help. And it's time to demand help and services from our system. While our story ends here, the Fakiri family continues to endure. With an upcoming coroner's inquest and the results of the OPP's reinvestigation still to come, they remain patient, steadfast, and hopeful. I'll be watching this case with them, and I hope you do too. While Suleiman Fakiri's death is much less of a mystery, the quest for justice is still unascertained. Unascertained is written and produced by me, Yusuf Zine, and Kevin Young. Kevin Young is also our audio engineer. Our story editor is Michelle Shepard. Our intern is Selena Gallardo. Our legal counsel is Willa Marcus. Katie O'Connor is our producer for TVO Podcasts. The executive producer of digital for TVO is Lori Few. The executive for current affairs and documentaries for TVO is John Ferry. Theme song and music by Blue Dot Sessions. Unascertained is produced by Innerspeak and TVO.